This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 895, recorded on April 28th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. It's update number 112. Can't wait to hear the hot off the presses, Daniel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, as uh, as you referred to, Vincent, I was uh, I sent you my update about an hour ago, and then I had to update it again. So that's just, you know, stuff keeps happening. Uh, but let's get right into it. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win or to lose. And that's by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, You know, spending last weekend down in D.C. had me thinking about presidents and that directed me this way, Um, but also thinking about um, hopefully uh, we still have uh, a bit ahead of us here and we can uh, learn from what we've done in the past and uh, we can see some success going forward. So first part of our update is expanded access and education for COVID therapeutics. Um, I love the fact that they're actually throwing education in there. Uh, People. People want to know. They want to, they want to be educated about their choices and options. So the U.S. government has a plan aimed at getting the pill. Actually, it's very Paxlovid focused. Um, the pill called Paxlovid to additional people who otherwise could face a more serious COVID illness. Um, and a couple points in this plan. The White House wants healthcare providers to err on the side of prescribing the pills rather than worrying about scarcity. So if you're not sure, if you're on the fence, go ahead, prescribe it. Um, uh, just a couple other things. As of April 25th, Paxlovid was already available at about 20,000 locations nationally. Uh, the goal is to get this up to 30,000. Um, the goal on where will these drugs be? The idea is to have them available at pharmacies as part of this uh, test and then treat or test to treat program. Go in, get your test, and immediately have access to the therapeutics. Community health centers. Um, urgent care centers, veteran affairs clinics. Um, and just to talk a little bit about, you know, the logistics on this. And actually, uh, one of my um, one of my friends, uh, Hadia Farouk, um, a hospital-based uh, pharmacist, um, she was actually saying that some of her colleagues out there in the private pharmacies, the retail pharmacies, as we call them, um, they're 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 a little overwhelmed already. So they were not sure how excited they were. Um, it might make more sense um, for those of you listening in policy level uh, positions. <laughs> um, the urgent care centers are. A little quieter now than they had been um, over the past couple of years. Uh, sort of an ideal spot for someone to go, um, get that test, um, have a clinician, a provider, um, be able to talk to them about the pros and cons because people like a little bit of education. Um, may also be an opportunity if needed to send off that um, kidney testing uh, blood work. Um, also an opportunity to look through the other meds, maybe make some clinical decisions like, is it okay to stop that low dose um, hypertension medicine or maybe that cholesterol medicine for a week or two? Um, so that might make a little bit of sense, but it's only going to make sense if those packs of packs Lovid are sitting there in those urgent cares. Also, some of our ERs, I think I mentioned, um, have them sitting there. People show up, they get the test. Uh, you've got a clinician who can work through this um, with them. So uh, just sort of editorializing a little bit. If we're going to make this work, we really have to think through the logistics. Um, we've really asked our, our pharmacy colleagues to do quite a bit here. Um, and sometimes it's nice to... Uh, think it through, make sure it works. And the one, and this will be to the pharmacy colleagues, um, if that ER doc, actually my buddy, Dr. Kaplan, who's the head of one of the Northwell ERs, he and I were talking earlier today, um, and he would send someone, um, send the Paxlovid prescription, and then they would get a call back from uh, the pharmacy wanting to talk to the ER about kidney function. He's like, listen, this is an ER. <laughs> um, if I've made a decision to start them on the medicines, I've checked that. Uh, but it sort of can be tough, right? The pharmacist has to do their due diligence. They don't, they don't want to give someone something. Um, but yeah, maybe the phone call back to the busy ER is not the, the best logistics here. 
Uh, let's go to children. We've got a lot on children, COVID, and vulnerable populations today. Um, and I will be talking hot off the press about some new news about vaccines for those under five. But uh, children are at risk for COVID. Um, summer is coming up. Um, camps and all these other things are on the horizon. Um, and we will have some exciting news in our therapeutic section as well. But let me start off with what is maybe not so positive. And this is the MMWR early release, seroprevalence of infection-induced SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, United States, September 2021 to February 2022. Uh, this is an MMWR early release. Um, and I'm going to go through what they have to say, but also I want to have a little discussion about um, how to interpret this data. So these, a lot of media attention focused on this. These are the results of the National Commercial Laboratory Seroprevalence Study, which is a cross-sectional national survey that estimates the proportion of the population in 50 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico, so I guess 52 different places, um, that have infection-induced antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. So what they're doing here is sera are tested for anti-nucleocapsid, so anti-N antibodies. These are produced in response to infection, but not produced in response to any of the COVID-19 vaccines currently authorized um, here in the U.S. Um, and, and here were the numbers. Based upon the sera prevalence um, as of February 2022, so theoretically this is a little bit higher, but 0 to 11 years of age, 75% were positive. 12 to 17, 74% were positive. Age 18 to 49, 64% were positive. Age 50 to 64, about 50%. And those age 65 and over, about 33%. Um, and I have a nice, um, nice sort of figure in there that I'm sharing here with Vincent. Um, but a few comments, I'll get Vincent to jump in as well. One is these are convenient samples, not random samples, right? So why are these people going and getting their blood drawn? That may suggest that uh, this is a population that's interacting with the, the healthcare system a little more than your random person. So maybe these numbers are a little high. The other side, right, is we know the sensitivity of serology and the durability of a quote unquote positive test is not 100%. That would be the side saying maybe this is an underestimation. Um, Vincent, any thoughts? So, you know, I think the, the uh, concern about a convenience sample is important because I'm struck by the decreasing seroprevalence. Um, and I was going to ask you what you thought about that. If it's correct, what would be the reason why as you get older, we see the seroprevalence going down? Yeah, I, I mean, my one thought might be maybe the older folks um, are less social, right? I, I think we've mm -hmm. seen like the, the social networks. I, I mean, maybe I'm at heart a 70-year-old because I somehow have not gotten COVID, which means I must not be social. Um, but no, <laughs> I think that, you know, a lot of people um, under the age of 50, I think we can lump them all here. The majority of people under the age of 50, if you take this data at face value, are, are having positive serology tests on this um, convenience sample. Um, much more social contact, much more um, sort of need or, or choice to be out there in higher risk situations. You know, if you're in your 70s or 80s, uh, you might be able to shelter at home. You might be able to turn down some of those social invites. You're not necessarily needing to go into a, a workplace or other um, higher risk settings. Um, you're not delivering food or landscaping or some of these other. Th those would be my thoughts. Yeah. I mean, obviously the kids are all in school, right? So that would give you a high seroprevalence. Uh, but, it's, you know, 50 to 64 years, they should be working. So yeah. it's funny that it's 49.8%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we, we try to say the schools are safe, Vincent. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to suggest it's the play dates in the suburban homes. Um, <laughs> okay. But, uh, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> all right. And now this is the hot off the press. This is, this is what required the quick update today. Um, uh, Moderna files for authorization of its COVID-19 vaccine in young children six months to under six years of age. Um, so we've already talked about the data here. This is based on the interim results from the phase two, three kid COVID study. Uh, this was announced uh, March 23rd, 2022. So we talked a little bit about the quote unquote robust neutralizing antibody response um, in the six month to under six years of age after a two dose primary series of the mRNA-1273. So that's the Moderna uh, vaccine uh, favorable safety profile. 
A um, couple things I will say here. Um, you know, a lot of this is sort of we're filing. And by the way, here's a recap of what we showed before. Uh, there was a little bit of an update when I looked at the prior press release and I looked at this one. Um, they did um, do another analysis where they were saying, we're going to look at cases where there was confirmed positive SARS-CoV-2 by a central lab with an RT-PCR, because um, our listeners may remember, probably not, uh, but home tests were allowed in um, the initial analysis that we talked about. Um, still seeing a vaccine efficacy at 51% um, for the um, six months to less than two. That was sort of the best. Um, only 37%, I'm going to say only, for two to less than six years. Um, and remember, this is vaccine efficacy against, um, I'm going to say, symptomatic um, COVID. It was all mild symptomatic. There was really no severe disease, no hospitalization, no death in anyone, either sort of side um, placebo or uh, vaccinated here. So we really don't get any comments on that. So that, that certainly leaves open the issue um, is, you know, we're, we're not trying to just prevent infections, right? We're trying to prevent severe disease. And it's going to be hard um, in one of these studies to, to get that data in a population that has a relatively low risk um, compared to adults of hospitalization and severe disease. So um, the EUA submission is going to be completed next week. Uh, that 15-day clock then starts. Um, but Moderna, just like Pfizer, is also looking at um, booster doses. So, um, you know, sort of suspicion down the line is that this will either be a farther spaced from first to second or really a three-shot series like it's becoming for um, most of the other folks, particularly in the face of uh, variants. All right. So I, I, think worry that, uh, I worry that because we can't assess severe disease, hospitalization, death, that they will say, oh, we need to prevent infection in these kids. And as you know, that's not a viable strategy, as you've said. Yeah. No, and I think that'll be a challenge. And it may be that we almost have to wait until after this is out there in the world next winter um, to be able to start seeing like the differences um, because we have had tens of thousands of children hospitalized. And so you will start to be able to see that boy vaccinated yeah. kids, you know, that would be anticipated. All right. Uh, testing. Um, never miss an opportunity to test, but uh, test wisely. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on, I think, about, um, you know, can you end your isolation early with testing and should you extend it longer with testing? So at some point, maybe we'll get back on that. But I just like to uh, my my favorite quotation now, Occam was not a physician, John Hickam was. Um, so just because you have a positive flu or a positive COVID test, you could have something else. So let's all keep that in mind. Uh, still, the pre-exposure period, how do we stay safe? I think the big thing now is the discussion of one-way masking. Um, if you're an older um, individual or an individual that has risk factors, uh, there still is the possibility of doing one-way masking if you have concerns. So wearing those, I don't really like they say high quality. So all the masks are very good quality. It's just a question of what type of mask. So the KN95, the N95, that might be the way that you can be in one of these situations with a lot of unmasked um, individuals. So just keep that in mind. Um, because as I was having a conversation with my parents uh, yesterday, um, I'm not sure how much better it gets than um, where we are now, right? Um, we've got vaccine, we've got very effective vaccines. We're about to extend them down to the under six. Uh, we have EVU shells, which we'll get to for passive vaccination. We're now getting to the point where we have um, effective antivirals, better access to those. So um, for a lot of folks, it's going to be making these decisions about um, when do you start um, sort of re-engaging in a lot of situations. All right, active vaccination. Um, the paper, Public Health Impact of COVID-19 Vaccines in the U.S. Observational Study was just published in the BMJ. Um, this was an observational study looking at the impact of vaccination on mortality. Um, the investigators really are using CDC data. So they're looking at CDC data on COVID-19 cases, deaths and vaccinations. Uh, they tracked mortality as the primary outcome. Um, they found that a 10% improvement in vaccination coverage was associated with an 8% 
reduction in mortality and a 7% reduction in incidence. Interesting. Um, higher vaccination coverage levels were associated with reduced mortality and incidence rates. And you could almost sort of calculate the efficacy of the vaccines with these impacts. So um, nothing surprising here, but you know, all the sort of caveats of an observational study. All right. Passive vaccination. Remember, we talked last week about Evusheld and the uh, intramuscular AZD7442 uh, tixagavimab, silgavimab for prevention of COVID-19 that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, not only an 80% reduction in symptomatic covid um, on top of what we were already getting from vaccines, right? So you've got your vaccines and another 80% reduction, um, but all the severe cases um, critical and all the deaths for COVID-19 occurred in the placebo group. Um, and I just want to point out the EUA, and I, I feel like maybe, you know, I don't know if we can take all the credit, but someone's doing something because the interest in Evusheld seems to have shot up. Uh, but remember, the EUA for Evusheld, these are individuals who have moderate to severe immune compromise due to a medical condition or receipt of immunosuppressive medications or treatments and may not mount an adequate immune response to COVID-19 vaccination or for whom there's some reason that we can't vaccinate them. So remember, you don't have to prove we're not checking antibody levels. We're not depriving them of this therapy if their antibodies are at some certain level. Um, remember, we have no FDA approved serology test that can be used for the purpose. Um, and pretty exciting this week, um, our large um, healthcare system here, Northwell, a shout out to Northwell. They just launched an online portal yesterday for providers. Uh, they can go to the website that we'll put in our show notes. This is great if you're in a Northwell um, area, maybe some other healthcare systems will mirror this, um, but you go online, um, you put the information in and the patient can be scheduled and they can get their Evu Shelt. All right. The period of detectable viral replication. Um, this is exciting. <laughs> Monday, April 25th, the U.S. FDA expanded the approval of the COVID-19 treatment um, Vecalori, remdesivir, to include pediatric patients 28 days of age and older, weighing at least three kilograms, about seven pounds, with positive results of direct SARS-CoV-2 viral testing who are either hospitalized, not hospitalized. Um, this makes... Um, Remdesivir, the first approved COVID-19 treatment for children less than 12 years of age. Um, so sort of a good good week for, for the youngest in our population. So let's just run through this because this is really the beat of this new initiative. Um, we now have effective tools when a person tests positive. Number one, remember, and this is an order, and the order changed this week, so a little excitement there. Number one, still Paxlovid. Remember about a 90% reduction in progression. Um, and just remember, the EUA for Paxlovid is for the treatment of mild to moderate um, COVID-19 in adults and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older, weighing at least 40 kilograms, right? So this is not for the under 12. A um, couple things I want to comment. Um, Paxlovid is not authorized for treatment in patients requiring hospitalization due to severe or critical COVID-19. Um, this is a little different than people getting admitted with mild or first week viral symptoms from COVID-19. Um, there's no limitation on the use there. This potentially, as per the EA, could be used in that setting. Um, and I think this is that important distinction that we're starting to talk about and starting to see in the guidance is Early on, the only people that were getting admitted with COVID were people second week. They were hypoxic. They required pulmonary support. Um, we are seeing more, we'll say, frail individuals getting admitted maybe in that first week because they're having GI issues. They're not hypoxic. They have not progressed to the early inflammatory phase, the severe critical COVID-19 phase. Um, there's nothing in here that says if you get admitted um, for that first week of COVID that you can't get Paxlovid. Um, the other thing I will say is they are not requiring symptoms. If this is a high-risk individual, you don't have to, you know, somehow uh, get them to admit to a symptom or not. Um, and this will be the last thing that, that comes up a little bit with regard to Paxlovid. Paxlovid is not authorized for use longer than five consecutive days. 
Um, now, Vincent, I don't know if you've caught wind of this, but initially I, I delayed doing interviews till I could kind of get a handle and talk to my providers about this. Um, but there are a few individuals out there, um, it seems to be a small percent, where they get acute COVID, they're symptomatic, they have a positive test, they take Paxlovid for five days, usually about day two or three, they're feeling better. Maybe they even go ahead and get a negative test at about day 11 or 12. Um, and then... 10 to 14 days later, they start feeling crummy again. Not as yes. crummy as the first time, yes. but crummy again, test positive again. Um, now, interesting enough, uh, I waited till I had talked to a bunch of different providers, had heard about half a dozen of these cases. Um, couple things. Um, this was actually seen in the trials. I didn't know that until hmm. um, actually it was a Bloomberg reporter. Thank you for steering me this way. And actually, they even sent me the, <laughs> the information, so that was helpful. Um, we're not thinking this is due to development of viral resistance. It just looks, and I sort of use the analogy of a urinary tract infection, you know, not everyone is going to be able to clear the virus and get through this with just five days. So for me, this is not surprising. We often run into this in medicine where some people may may need a, a second course of treatment. Um, it's a little tricky right now under the EUA, but Vincent, as a virologist, what any thoughts, any comments? Yeah, I've heard of this also, and uh, we were asked about it uh, last night on our live stream. And I said, I would ask you what you thought, <laughs> but it seemed to me that there's no evidence for viral resistance. Um, I'm not sure why they say that, because to do that, you'd have to isolate virus and check it for resistance in vitro. And that needs to be done in a BSL-3. So there are very few places that can do that right away. But yeah. it, I think, well, your explanation is perfectly reasonable that uh, five days is just not enough for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that that's a good point. There is people have, um, it was actually a virologist, we won't name who it was, but they actually, you know, they had the sample before they got Paxlova, they had sample and they sequenced, right? So okay. that's, sequen that's sequencing. I, I thought that was pretty good. Um, yeah, and apparently a the, couple of times, but yeah, but you really want to do that. We don't yet know what changes confer resistance, right? Yes, yeah, so that would be the issue, right, with relying on that. <laughs> I mean, so. you could say, oh, there's a change in the protease, the target yep. of Paxlovid, but you'd really need to know, as you know for HIV, you know which mutations confer resistance to which drug, right? So you sequence. Yeah. So we, we're not quite there yet, but first, and I know that there is a lab here in New York City who could readily do the, the sensitivity testing, right? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's uh, there's a lab. Uh, yeah, you're you're recording it not too far from it. You used to record yeah, actually, like what, just a couple below, <laughs> a couple yeah, floors below. There are several um, yeah. labs here in New York that could do that. So I expect it'll be done reasonably. And then once we know, there's no resistance. But I do think we need to find out what changes are associated with resistance as well. Right? Yeah, and certainly important to track. Uh, you know. So, because, you know, what do you do when that happens? Um, do you switch to an alternative? Uh, these people tend to be doing pretty well. So maybe you don't even need to do anything at that point. So important to know. So in these individuals, they feel crummy and then they get better again? Yes. And that's the nice thing. At least so far, what we're seeing is that second, oh, I started to feel crummy again, is not as bad as the first, um, you know, the first week of symptoms when they get the first treatment. So, But they're not treated again, are they? So far, no. So far, no. Yeah. Okay. All right. And number two is now remdesivir. It changed. The order has changed. Remember before it was monoclonals. Now remdesivir has risen to level two. Um, the order has changed. And actually, this is going to present some challenges, hopefully challenges we will rise to, um, you know, in the sort of spirit of Lyndon Johnson. Um, we have the three-day early IV data suggesting about an 87% reduction in progression if given in those first five days. Um, I have to admit, a lot of times this is what we're doing if those folks end up in the hospital in that first week because it's, it's licensed. We can go ahead and do it. They're in the hospital, so it's easy to get the IV access. Um, there's plenty of remdesivir around. Um, and remember now, this is the pediatric um, option. So this is now something down to 28 days of age. Um, so this is really anyone can sort of get access to this. Also nice, right? We don't have to worry about the drug-drug interactions. Um, we're actually using this people who are even on dialysis. So we're not particularly concerned about renal function as well. Um, the trick is getting the logistics set up. Um, I'll say the day this came out, I um, immediately... Uh, reached out to uh, Stefan Mulbauer over at St. Francis Hospital, and um, his response was, well, if this is now licensed, we will make sure that we can start providing it. So start sending the kids our way. So 
Um, yeah, what do you do if you're not within 15 minutes of St. Francis Hospital and Stephen Mulpower? I'm not sure. Um, but no, we've got we've to make sure that, think about it, if you have a child who's high risk, they're under 12, this is the option that can make a difference. So we've got to make sure that we, um, we take on those operational challenges. Uh, number three, monoclonal therapy. Um, right now, that's bebtilovimab. But remember, this is only down to 12 years of age, only down to folks weighing 40 kilograms or more. Um, so this is not something we can be looking at in the pediatric population. Remember, this has moved down to number three. Um, number four, Thor's hammer, malnupiravir, last option, about 30% reduction in progression, so less impressive, um, but no renal issues, no drug generator. Drug, drug interactions, but be careful in those women of childbearing age. I want that negative pregnancy test. And this is not authorized in children under 18. So even a little bit more, got to be over 18 for this uh, medication. All right, the early inflammatory phase, um, steroids at the right time, right? This is that individual who starts to get hypoxic. The oxygen level drops below 94. Not everyone goes into the early inflammatory or the severe COVID stage. Most people don't. Um, but should they, should they fall through the cracks? And that's what I've been sort of describing this. 90% reduction in ending up here with vaccinations. Another 80% reduction if we get ebu shelled to those high-risk folks. Another... 87 to 90 percent reduction if we get early treatment in the in these folks but sometimes we miss every opportunity um, and here we are steroids maybe we're considering tocilizumab um, we're talking about anticoagulation right dose right patient um, but more news about sabizabulin and and vincent there's no t i thought there was a t so apparently it rhymes with zelensky but not with Putin. <laughs> very good i love it <laughs> um, so as we so we previously discussed a phase three trial with a 55 percent reduction in deaths in hospitalized patients but now we heard um, this was a phase two data that was presented at the 32nd european congress of clinical microbiology and infectious diseases lisbon portugal april 23 to 26 Sabizabulin for the treatment of hospitalized severe COVID-19 at high risk for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and here we, we just have the abstract and the presentation, um, but these were the results of a double blind randomized placebo controlled phase two clinical trial evaluating this oral once a day dosing of sabizabulin. Uh, this is supposed to be interfering with the tubulin um, and the cytokine production, but they looked at sabizabulin versus placebo um, in approximately 40 hospitalized COVID-19 patients who are at high risk of progression to ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, conducted at five sites across the United States, patients hospitalized with document, documented evidence of COVID-19. Um, subjects received either the sabizabulin or, or placebo, um, and then you could give them steroids, anticoagulants, whatever else you wanted to do. Um, respiratory failure, um, that was the primary endpoint, was the proportion of patients alive without respiratory failure at day 29, um, and respiratory failure was defined as endotracheal intubation, mechanical ventilation, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, so ECMO, high flow nasal cannula oxygen, non-invasive positive pressure. Um, it was a lot here, right? <laughs> so what did we find out in this cohort of patients? Sabizabulin treatment resulted in an 82% relative reduction in deaths. Um, furthermore, sabizabulin resulted in a reduction in mean days in the ICU, 9.6 versus 2.6. So about a seven-day reduction there, uh, about a 73% relative reduction in mean days in the ICU. Um, really, I, I have to say, I, I'm growing optimism, um, you know, as we sort of keep marching down this road. Now, maybe folks who are in the hospital, um, we can do even more than just um, steroids and some of the other supportive things we do. All right, the tail phase, 
COVID is not just a two-week viral illness for many people. Um, clinical characteristics with inflammation profiling of long COVID and association with a one-year recovery following hospitalization in the UK, a prospective observational study was published in The Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Um, and these are the results of the FOS COVID, so the post-hospitalization COVID-19 study, uh, which is a prospective longitudinal cohort study recruiting adults, got to be 18 or older, discharged from hospital with COVID-19 across the UK. Um, recovery was assessed using patient reported outcome measures, physical performance, organ function at five months, and one year after hospital discharge. And I, I like, actually, I mean, I, I like the introductions in a lot of these, um, these publications um, where they're really honest and they say that currently there are no evidence-based effective pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions for patients with long COVID. So just sort of um, sobering that we're, we're here. But in this group, 2,320 participants were discharged from hospital um, between March 7, 2020 and April 18, 2021. Uh, they were assessed at five months after discharge. Um, we have 32.7 participants completing both the five-month and one-year visits. Uh, mean age here, 58.7. Um, 224, so about 28% uh, ended up receiving mechanical ventilation. Um, the proportion of patients reporting full recovery was unchanged between five months and one year. So 25.5% um, were basically still having um, issues. Um, and what were the factors that were associated? Well, female sex, um, obesity, those who ended up on uh, mechanical ventilation, um, but a couple other things, and, you know, and people who are excited about the um, immunology, um, they found increased inflammatory mediators of tissue damage and repair, including IL-6 concentration, um, and really actually an, a hodgepodge of a number of other ones. Um, so hopefully we're getting a little bit of a better sense here. Um, all right. Well, let me close on the note that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, right here, we are finishing up the last, last day or two of our American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene fundraiser. So go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, click the donate button, um, help us get to our goal so that we can uh, donate potentially up to $40,000 um, to support um, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And as part of the support will be scholarships for their annual meeting travel awards to attend the 20. 22 meeting in Seattle, Washington, with priority for these scholarships being placed on females from low and middle income countries who might not otherwise be able to attend. Time for some questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. So the first one, Daniel, you have answered. It was from Debbie, an MD, who said, can you comment on the resurgence of symptoms and positive tests after testing negative in patients who have taken Paxlovid. What do we know? Who will be studying this? You've answered that. Oh, excellent. Well, that's right, right on point. Good question. Good question. All right. Katie writes, I'm a nurse in Austin, Texas. I work at a cardiologist office. Recently, I spoke with a patient over the age of 65 with coronary artery disease who was asking for a letter of exemption from the COVID vaccine. He stated he gave the cardiologist a letter explaining that his brother had a heart attack after receiving the second vaccine. That is why he did not wish to receive the vaccine, even though he is a believer that vaccines are effective. Included were seven articles, some from Yale, he said, with documentation that this is a proven side effect. I know of the risk for myocarditis with both virus and vaccine, but I can't find any articles on this scenario. My question is, if someone is at risk for a heart attack before vaccine, how could it be determined that it was the vaccine that caused it versus other pathophysiology? That doesn't seem possible, but I'm not a physician or in research. You know, this this is um, an excellent thing to bring up. And I, I think all the way across the board, we found that um, you know your your choice to get vaccinated is much choice than much safer than your choice not to get vaccinated. Um, and one of the things I think um, when you look at um, how many people have died from COVID, uh, still cancer and heart disease are beating COVID in this country, uh, which is crazy. That um, you know half a million people are dying every year from from you know 
cancer, half a million people more dying from heart disease. Um, so just think about the odds. You're, you're an older man. You have coronary artery disease. Um, the coincidence, there will be certain people that have heart attacks before they get vaccinated. There will be certain individuals that have heart attacks after they get vaccinated. What we clearly know, though, is getting COVID without the protection of a vaccine is associated with a significant increase in your chance of ending up having a heart attack in the next six months. So um, it would be the exact opposite. I, I would counsel this person that they are much safer being vaccinated um, than waiting, getting COVID, and having that months and months of elevated risk. Of course, you can never figure out if someone got a heart attack the day after the vaccine, if it was something else or not, then they'll never believe you, right? Well, so that's the challenge, right? I think one of the studies that was a child who swallowed a penny and then they were claiming that maybe penny swallowing was associated with the medication. <laughs> Things happen. <laughs> yes, right. All right. Uh, one from Last one from Brian. I have a Paxlovid question. Minus renal dosing adjustments and drug interactions, would you have any hesitation about prescribing Paxlovid to someone with liver disease, cirrhosis, NASH, NAFLID, based on the listed potential adverse reactions, hepatitis, hepatotoxicity, jaundice? The FDA fact seat sheet simply says use caution in patients with liver disease, but I'm curious where you would draw the line clinically. Yeah, so I, I guess this will be a testament to uh, how much I've been thinking and reading um, and involved with Paxlovid recently that I'm, I'm going to tell you which subsection of the EUA to go look at. Uh, it is subsection 5.3. Um, but where they mention the, the concerns about liver toxicity, it's actually based upon ritonavir. Um, and the, the thought is that we have seen um, over the years in the treatment of HIV individuals, um, we've seen issues with ritonavir. Um, but the thought is with the five days, with the short dose, we really don't expect to see uh, much in the way of liver issues. So I, I would really say it would have to take quite a bit for me to, to not take a high-risk person. So think about someone who has high risk because of liver disease, acutely infected with COVID, um, I'm usually going to feel pretty comfortable going ahead with Paxlovid. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 112 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone be safe. 